Hello and thank you for joining us for today's video where we'll be looking at haunting deathbed confessions. I'm assuming by checking out this video you like interesting crime and mystery stories. If you do, you should check out today's sponsor, June's Journey. I love a good detective hidden object game and it doesn't get any better than the free to download mobile game June's Journey. In June's Journey you follow June Parker as she tries to solve the murder of her sister in the backdrop of the roaring 1920s. There's a diverse cast of characters who are all fascinating. Each scene gets you closer to solving the murder, but be careful, June may unearth family secrets that some people would rather leave buried. But luckily, June has an amazing knack for getting herself out of dangerous situations, all while helping out her friends. Not only are there fun, hidden object puzzles to solve, but you also get to customize, remodel, and fix your mansion and garden island. My favorite part is trying to solve the puzzles. I tend to play June's Journey in the evening when I'm relaxing. There's nothing better than laying on my couch, watching some TV, and finding some hidden objects. But then, I usually get to bed late because I have so much fun playing it and I lose track of time. Why not have some fun yourself and check out June's Journey? Download June's Journey for free by clicking on the link in the description or scan the QR code on the screen. June's Journey is available on Android and iOS mobile devices as well as on PC through Facebook games. Check out June's Journey today. Number 3. Geraldine Kelly John and Geraldine Kelly met in the 1950s in Somerville, Massachusetts, a city near Boston. They grew up in the area and were high school sweethearts. They eventually got married. However, their relationship was far from idyllic. The couple argued often, but no one ever saw things get physical. Geraldine, who went by Jerry, was known to be tough and wouldn't back down from anyone. John abused alcohol and tended to be a mean drunk. In August 1981, John got into a drunken brawl at a family wedding. He punched his 42-year-old brother-in-law, Edward Gordonier. Gordonier ended up in a coma and died from his injuries. In October 1982, John and three others were charged for their roles in the fight. John was charged with being a disorderly person and assault and battery. No one was charged with manslaughter or murder. John never claimed responsibility for the death of his brother-in-law, but he did say he punched him out. Instead of dealing with legal consequences, John, Jerry, and their two children moved across the country to California. John and Jerry found work managing apartment complexes, but wasn't stable and they bounced around a lot. Moving across the country didn't improve John and Jerry's relationship. Their children got tired of the constant fighting. In the late 1980s, when their son and daughter were in their late teens, they became estranged from their parents. In late 1991, John and Jerry, who were now in their 40s, started working as managers at the Victoria Hotel in Ventura, California. The motel owners were happy with the hire. John did maintenance work like painting, plumbing, and other odd jobs, while Jerry was tough enough to handle the sometimes unsavory clientele. The hotel staff often heard the couple arguing. Then, in either late 1991 or early 1992, John suddenly went missing. Jerry told the hotel owners that John moved back to Massachusetts to help with the family business. A couple days later, Jerry told the hotel owners that John had died. While he was crossing a street in Boston, he was struck by a drunk driver. But she told the housekeepers different stories about what happened to John. She told one of them that he had died in a car accident in Nevada. She told another one that he was drunk and was struck by a car outside of a jack-in-the-box restaurant. Not long after John's supposed death, Jerry reconnected with her children. She told them that her father died in a car accident in Las Vegas, Nevada, and that's where he was buried. Although the Kellys were not close to their relatives, some of John's family did look for him. Some family members in Massachusetts called Nevada hospitals but didn't find anything out about John. His sister wanted to hire a private investigator, but she could not afford it. Jerry worked at the hotel for another six years. In 1998, she returned to Somerville to care for her mother. Six years later, in November 2004, 54-year-old Jerry Kelly was dying of cancer. 
On November 12, 2004, Jerry's daughter was by her side. Jerry told her the truth about what happened to her father. She claimed that for years, John had been physically abusive. Then, about 12 years ago, she shot him in the head. She then put his body in a chest freezer. The freezer was in a nearby storage unit. Later that day, 54-year-old Geraldine Kelly died. Days later, her daughter called the police. They went to the storage unit. They found a freezer that was unplugged, locked, and sealed with duct tape. There was a disturbing odor emanating from the freezer. Inside of it were mummified human remains. Based on the tattoos and the description of John Kelly, the police determined it was his remains. An autopsy was performed, and the medical examiner determined he had most likely died from being shot in the back of the head. A 38 caliber bullet was found in John's head. In Jerry's apartment, the police found a 38 caliber handgun. Ballistic testing determined it was the murder weapon. The police believe that in late 1991 or early 1992, Jerry shot John and put his body in a freezer that was in a storage unit on the motel's property. She kept the storage unit locked. And an extension cord ran from a different room into the storage unit. As added security, she kept one of her Rottweilers tied to a stake near the storage unit. Eventually, she moved the freezer to a nearby storage facility. In 1998, when she moved 3,000 miles across the country, she paid a moving company to ship all her belongings, including the freezer, with the dead body of her husband. The movers didn't notice any unusual odors coming from the freezer. During her deathbed confession, Geraldine Kelly said she confessed to unburden herself. She also didn't want her children to be blamed if the body was found. Number 2. Torhepsa On October 6, 1977, the body of 20-year-old Torin Finstad was found in Trondheim, Norway. She had been raped and then she was strangled to death with a cord from a raincoat. Finstad was last seen four days earlier. The day after her body was found, the police made an arrest. They arrested 36-year-old Fritz Mohn. Mohn was born in Oslo, Norway in 1941. His father was a German soldier and his mother was Norwegian. He was conceived during the Nazi occupation of Norway. Shortly after he was born, Mohn was given up for adoption. Mohn was born deaf and lived in a deaf boarding house where he learned Norwegian Sign Language. Because he was deaf, he had a speech impediment. He also didn't have mobility in his right arm. Mohn's intelligence was average and he had a good memory. The police suspected him because he had a criminal record. It was mostly property crimes. But in a few incidences, he had tried to grab women's crotches. He had also exposed himself to women and children. Moan denied having anything to do with the murder. He also had an alibi for his whereabouts on the night of the murder. He was at a party until the early morning. The police interviewed witnesses who said Moan was at the party at the time he said he was. No physical evidence tied Moen to the crime and no witnesses saw him with Fitzdan or in the area where the body was found. Doubting his alibi, the police subjected Moen to intense and lengthy questioning with no interpreter to effectively help him communicate. Under the pressure, Moen started contradicting himself about aspects of his alibi. He then started giving details about the murder. The problem was that he had access to local newspapers and all the information he gave was in articles about the murder. He also made statements about the murder that were completely inaccurate. Another problem was that the victim was strangled to death and her body was moved. But Mullen didn't have mobility in his right arm. With just one fully functional arm, he may not have been physically able to commit the murder and move the body. Nevertheless, Mullen was charged with Finstad's murder. Fritz Mohn was convicted of murder, and on May 29, 1978, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison and 10 years of preventative supervision. The Supreme Court ended up reducing the sentence to 16 years. After almost three years in prison, Mohn's lawyers petitioned the court to reopen the Finstad case. 
the police did not want to reopen the case. Not only were they sure that he had committed that murder, they believed that Moen had committed another murder. On September 11th, 1976, almost a year before Turner Finstadt's murder, 20-year-old Sigrid Hagheim's body was found in Trotheim. The killer strangled and attempted to rape Hagheim. She was last seen alive six days earlier when she was leaving a party. The murders of Finstad and Hagheim were very similar. They were both 20 and studied at the Norwegian Institute of Technology. Both murders were sexually motivated. They were both strangled with cords from the rain jackets and they suffered head injuries. Finally, the crimes were committed in the same area within months of each other. Because of the strong similarities, the police believe that the same man killed them. Since Moen had been convicted of one of the murders, they concluded that he must have committed the other murder. Moen was questioned seven times. During the seventh interrogation, his interpreter was sent out of the room to get Moen some dinner. While the interpreter was out of the room, the police claimed that he confessed. On September 15, 1981, Fritz Moen was indicted for Hagheim's murder and attempted rape. During Moen's December 1981 trial, it was revealed that the police did testing on semen found on Hagheim's body. They determined it was type A blood. Moen did not have type A blood. The prosecution claimed E. coli had altered the results. Moen also had an alibi for the time of the murder. Hagheim went missing after attending a party. When she went missing, Moen was 45 miles from Trondheim. The prosecution argued that Hagheim and Moen crossed paths later that day. On December 18, 1981, Fritz Moen was once again convicted of murder. The presiding judge added five more years on to Moen's 16-year sentence. Moen's defense lawyer, Olaf Hestenses, was outraged by the decision and publicly shamed the court. He said, quote, For the first time at this desk, I allow myself to say that a travesty of justice has been committed. Unquote. The remark offended the presiding judge. Moen's lawyer appealed, and in 1982, it was rejected. In 1996, Moen was released from prison after serving nearly 18 years. The courts still considered him dangerous, and in 1999, they tacked on five additional years of preventative supervision. Fritz Moen always maintained his innocence. A few people believed him and took up his case. The first was Tor Sandberg, a private investigator and former journalist who covered the murders in Moen's trials. After meeting with Moen, he decided to investigate his case pro bono. The second person was Oslo attorney John Christian Eldon. Shortly before he agreed to help Moen, he had worked with Sandberg to help exonerate another wrongly convicted man. Like Sandberg, he worked on Moen's case pro bono. In 2000, Eldon requested the case to be reopened for three reasons. They were the suspicious confessions, the lack of physical evidence, and the prosecution's failure to disclose favorable witness statements in both cases. In February 2002, the appeals court rejected his bid. Alden took the case to the Supreme Court Appeals Committee in October 2003. Moen's team got DNA testing done on the semen. The results proved that the semen found at the scene did not belong to Moen. The testing also proved that E. coli did not alter the results. The appeals committee overturned one conviction, Sigurd Hagheim's murder, which was the second murder Moen was convicted of. Moen went to trial again in October 2004, and this time he was acquitted. A week after his acquittal, Moen petitioned the newly formed Norwegian Criminal Case Review Commission, or the CCRC, to review the Finstad case. Unfortunately, Moen would not see his name completely cleared. He died of natural causes at age 63, on March 24, 2005. Moen's supporters continued to fight for his innocence even after his death. Moen's half-brother wrote a letter to the CCRC on April 2, 2005, urging them to reopen the case. John Christian Eldon continued to represent Moen. Tor Sandberg submitted documents for the petition. Later that year, a twist in the case gave Moen's defense the boost it needed. 
On December 18, 2005, 67-year-old Toru Hepsa was dying in the hospital. Hepsa confessed to three nurses that he murdered two women in the 1970s. The nurses contacted the police and a priest, and Hepsa told them the same story. He said he was a heavy drinker and murdered two women while drunk. Hespa specifically named Torun Fitzstad and Sigrid Hegheim. Attending nurses also found Bibles where Hepso underlined Proverbs 6 verses 12 to 15, which reads, A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers. Frowardness in his heart, he divideth mischief continually, he soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly, Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. He also underlined Proverbs chapter 16, verses 27 to 30, which reads, An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lips there is as a burning fire. A froward man soweth strife, and a whisper separateth chief friends. A violent man entices his neighbor, and leadeth him into the way that is not good. He shutteth his eyes to devise froward things, moving his lips to bringeth evil to pass. Torah Hespa died on December 20th, 2005, two days after confessing to the murders. The CCRC investigated the validity of Hespa's confessions. When the murders were committed, Hespa was in his late 30s and lived to work in Trondheim. Hespa had a long history of alcohol abuse and mental problems. In 1979, he was admitted to an institution after a mental breakdown. In 1986, his partner reported him to the police for domestic abuse and attempted murder. She claimed he had nearly strangled her to the point of unconsciousness. In another incident, he hit her on the head and threw her up against the wall. She also claimed that he forced her to have sex. In 1987, Hespa supposedly admitted he ended the relationship by being violent. Hespa later denied saying this and the case was dropped in 1988 due to a lack of evidence. The CCR's findings noted that Hespa had type A blood, which is the same blood type as the person who attempted to rape Hagheim. However, the CCRC could not get a sample of Hespa's DNA. Despite this, the CCRC said that Hespa's confession was credible. As for Fritz Moen, the CCRC used linguistic experts to determine if his statements to the police were misunderstood during his original interrogations. The report didn't say that Moen was coerced, but it did say it was plausible that he was misconstrued. Finally, the CCRC concluded the information found would have led to Moen's acquittal in Fitzstadt's murder. On August 24, 2006, the Court of Appeals posthumously acquitted Fritz Moen. Moen's wrongful death conviction caused outrage in Norway. In response, the Norwegian government set up an inquiry to, quote, find out why Moen was wrongly convicted and evaluate whether changes are needed in the criminal justice system to avoid wrongful convictions in the future, unquote. The four-person commission released their 492-page report on Moen's wrongful convictions on June 25, 2007. The report was critical of the police for neglecting evidence and said they were thoroughly investigated. The inquiry was also highly critical of the presiding judges in his case, resulting in calls for their impeachment. Ultimately, they were not impeached. Thor Sandberg, the prime investigator who fought to vindicate Moen, was recognized for his work. In 2005, he received the Zola Prize awarded to, quote, a person who openly and courageously has uncovered or opposed conditions that threaten human dignity, democracy, and the rule of law in Norway." Unquote. Sandberg was also awarded Amnesty International Norway's Human Rights Prize for 2006. Finally, that same year, he won the Norwegian government's biannual Human Rights Prize. Pritzmo was posthumously awarded $4 million and issued an unqualified apology from the Norwegian government. It was the largest compensation amount paid out in Norwegian history. His half-brothers donated the money to charitable causes in his memory. One of the charities, the Conrad Svetson Center, operates homes and cares for deaf and blind adults. The other charity, the Signal Foundation, 
sponsors programs that aid people who are deaf or are hard of hearing. Members of the public also recommended a bust or statue of Fritz Moen to be put in front of Norway's Ministry of Justice building. This commemoration would serve as a reminder of the worst miscarriage of justice in the country's history. By the time of this recording, there is no bust or statue. Number 1. Marjorie Hunt In the late summer of 1962, Diana Moon Yoli was 7 years old and her half-brother, Mark Yoli, was 3. Diana was a product of her mother Marilyn's first marriage. After divorcing Diana's father, Marilyn married Ronald Yoli, a Marine Corporal. Ronald was the father of Mark. The family had lived in Columbus, Ohio, but that summer they were living at Camp Lejeune in Jacksonville, North Carolina because Ronald was stationed there. Around 3.15 p.m. on September 13, 1962, Diana and Mark were playing at Midway Park, close to their home. When Marilyn went to check on them, they weren't at the park. Initially, Marilyn wasn't too worried. Marilyn described Diana as a chronic wanderer. Once, Diana had wandered off and was found sleeping in a neighbor's car several hours later. But after looking around, the siblings were nowhere to be found. So Marilyn called the police. No one saw the children talking to anyone or leaving the park. The 2nd Marine Division formed a search party of over a thousand men to search the woods and swamps around the base. The team also searched hundreds of acres of woodland and residential areas. Searchers checked deserted ice boxes and abandoned houses. After two days of searching, the team shrunk down to 500 people. Boats come the river beside the base. The search entered the military base itself, which is wooded. The searchers did not find any clues as to what happened to the children. On the fourth day of searching, the team dwindled down to 250 people. When they didn't find anything, the search was called off. The Oles thought that passing motorists might have picked up the children. The police believed that the children met with foul play. The police investigated as much as possible, but with no leads or clues, the case eventually went cold. Thirty long years went by. Then, in May 1992, 70-year-old Marjorie Hunt was on her deathbed. She called the Sheriff's Department. She said she knew what happened to 7-year-old Diana and 3-year-old Mark. But by the time the police got to her, she had died. However, she had confessed to her daughter. Marjorie's ex-husband was Henry Morris Hunt. He died less than a year earlier, in October 1991, at age 85. He was a convicted child molester. When the children went missing, Marjorie and Henry lived off the base about 13 miles from where they went missing. On her deathbed, Marjorie told her daughters that Henry had found the kids at the park. He said he took them fishing on his boat. He claimed that three-year-old Mark accidentally drowned. He panicked and killed seven-year-old Diana. He then dumped their bodies in a mine about 30 miles from Camp Lejeune in Maysville, North Carolina. The Sheriff's Department got some expert advice from geologists and they said that searching the mine would be pointless because the quarries and lakes feeding into them have changed a lot in the past three decades. They followed the advice of the geologists and searched a water-filled quarry, but the search turned up nothing. The Sheriff, Ed Brown, believes what Marjorie Hunt said in her deathbed confession. However, he does not believe that her ex-husband told her the truth regarding the death of the children. He believes that they were kidnapped for sexual purposes, then they were killed. Sheriff Brown was working for the Sheriff's Department when the siblings went missing and he was aware of the case. He also knew who Henry Hunt was. He knew him even before he got into law enforcement. He had a girlfriend who lived on the property that backed onto the Hunt's family's property. Neighborhood kids were told to stay away from their home. One thing that Sheriff Brown remembered was that his girlfriend had a German Shepherd. Any time the dog got loose, he tried to dig under the Hunts' house. After the death by confession, Sheriff Brown kept track of who owned the house where the Hunts lived. 
Two decades after the haunting deathbed confession, the property was sold to a developer who planned on demolishing the house. Sheriff Brown asked him to let him know if they found anything suspicious. In February 2011, the developer called the sheriff. Under some floorboards, they found a shovel, a jawbone, two small bones, and a child-sized pink vinyl belt. However, it was determined that the bones were not human. As of February 2024, Diana Munioli and Mark Yoli have not been found dead or alive. If they are still alive, Diana would be 68 and Mark would be 64, but the police believe they are dead and Henry Morris Hunt murdered them. Thank you so much for watching today's video. We want to say a big thanks to our sponsor, June's Journey. Download the game for free by clicking on the link or scan the QR code on the screen now. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.